It is an owner's tax to take on this topic of the coronavirus. It is the news media topic of the day. And I'm going to try to uh, give us a medical perspective on this condition. My background being internal medicine and rheumatology, immunology, I have to address the uh, issues of patients being immune suppressed, at the same time taking those same immune suppressed disorders and treating them with immune suppressive medications. So I'm always under surveillance of looking for the opportunistic infection or the superbug that might be of harm to my patients. And I've been in that same mode for decades. And because of that, I was on the heightened awareness of what's going around in the hospital environments and clinics that may be a threat to our patient populations we're serving. So coronavirus came up as a topic the first of the year. In the first few days of its announcement, I took heed and listened to every bit of material I could gather on it to understand what it would represent to our future care of medicine. I have no financial relationships or disclosures. I have to uh, tell you I'm going to try to give this in the most scientific way possible, not to cause harm or alarm or panic, but to give us some knowledge to work with and how to brace ourselves moving forward. I'll try to give you the current update of information as much as possible. You can take your own phones right now and Google up and find what's happening to the moment's notice, which is great technology to have at hand. I'll tell you some ways that we're making the diagnosis and treatment of this disorder, and I'll give you some ideas of the future implications of what we're had to face, as well as perhaps some treatment options we can consider. A fascinating story the Eyes of Darkness, a book that was written in science fiction book, was written in 1981. And in this book, the author proposes that there was a Wuhan 400 virus that got loose in China and resulted in a pandemic. So it's a situation where science fiction becomes science truth, interesting in, in all perspectives. What is the coronavirus to begin with? And when do we first take note of it? It was in 1967, in 66, when Tyrell and another scientist came together and realized that this was a source of what causes us to have the common cold. And this is the picture of it, and you see that it has on it, this image, a crown-like configuration. That's where they got the name corona, the crown-like appearance of the virus. More recently, with our technology, this is what the coronavirus looks like under electron microscope. Another picture just released by the CDC once again. You see the shape of the virus. You see the crown-like configuration of the outer surface layer. When I first heard the announcement that there was a SARS-like virus involvement in China, I paused and I listened to extra acutely to the television as to what they were talking about. And I, because we look at this configuration, the genus of virus in this, this big conglomerate, but it's in the beta side of these coronaviruses that we have MERS and we have the SARS. Now, why was that alarming to me when I heard that announcement? Well, in 2002, SARS, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, was a beta coronavirus that was first di diagnosed or realized in China. They thought it came from a, a cat-like species of animal. It resulted in over 8,000 cases with a 10% mortality, around 774 people passed away after being exposed to that virus. So very lethal in its presentation and the consequences of coming down with the infection. So SARS has always been an alarm signal to us as far as being a dangerous type of organism. As compared to MERS, which occurred in 2012, MERS stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another beta corona virus in Saudi Arabia, thought to come from bats. There were about 2,500 cases, which resulted in death rate of 858. Again, very lethal, very pronounced symptoms, fever, chills, and it would take you down quickly to your ill, you could not function in a matter of a few hours. So these are type of viruses that have been surveyed by 
the healthcare systems, WHO, the World Health Organization, and by the CDC, Center for Disease Control, have kept their eyes on these type of viruses intensely for decades. Now, if someone, once again, as the book in 1981 was talking about, could put a pin on the map of the world as to the place to start an epidemic, you could not pick a better place than Wuhan, China. It sets as a po population of uh, 11 million people in the center of the industrial complex of China, the most highly concentrated population on the earth. So it's the center of the world's population. And this is where it all began. In December, end of December, is when the first announcement leaked out that there was a SARS-like potential pneumonia occurring in Wuhan. It progressed rapidly that the first announcement came at the end of December of 19, 2019. And then we had the first death reported by January the 11th in timeline. <clears throat> there was a whistleblower who's now famous, Dr. Lee, a young 34-year-old ophthalmologist. But he was part of a little group of doctors that were discussing that they were seeing these cases in the hospital. Even though he's an ophthalmologist, he was aware that these cases were in the hospital. It was a SARS-like pneumonia. And they started having this dialogue back and forth on the internet with each other. And it became sanctioned. The, the, the government of China found out about this discussion, dialogue going on, closed it down, gave, gave them threatening notice, which is this letter right here saying, cease and desist with your comments and statements about this virus. Make no further comments at all. He himself then became infected with the virus at the end of January, and he succumbed to the infection by February 7th and passed. But he's been memorialized already because he was trying to get the word out to his colleagues, watch out, we've got a problem. And feel free to take pictures of these, the, these screens right here if you'd like to, to help you. We'll also have these available to you uh, through the ATSU later on for reference points. So it, the Wuhan virus in 2019 was called a novel coronavirus. Now what's novel mean? Well, novel means new, a first exposure. That's alarming. The first time in record in history of medicine, we see this virus causing a disease in humans. We knew it was a beta, again, a beta coronavirus. That put it in the SARS-like category of viruses. The origins have been argued. It appears that probably it came from bats. The bats are, notoriously for, are notorious for harvesting hundreds of coronaviruses in their species because they congregate, you know, in the caves and pass it amongst themselves. And they've become very tolerant of it. But once a virus leaps into another species, that's when it can raise havoc and cause concern. So right now, approximately, we can look at these numbers for accuracy, but 100,000 cases have been reported. There's lots of estimates saying that's only 1 to 10% of the actual numbers. So it's far greater numbers than what we're seeing being reported. I'll tell you why a little later on. Death rates, somewhere estimates are say, again, 8,000 so far worldwide. But again, there's been questions as whether the accuracy of that is true or not, and it could be considerably more than 8,000 deaths. This is when we came up with the name, the International Committee on Toxi Toxiometry of Viruses, named this on February the 11th, the sars cov 2 virus, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Corona-2 virus. That's the virus name. The disease it causes is called COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. So those are the names you see thrown out in the media, discussed by scientists. The first one being the virus, the second thing being the disease the virus causes. Once again, history repeats itself. One of the best reference points you can have for what this epidemic potentially means is by reading what happened in history a little over 100 years ago in 1918, the great influenza that occurred during a time of World War I. 
a pandemic that went around the world in a very short period of time, the origins is probably out of the central part of Kansas, a military base in Kansas, although it ended up being called the Spanish flu, and I'll tell you why. It was called the Spanish flu in a few minutes. The other book is equally an exciting, exciting book to read about the, the flu epidemic and how they went back and they went to the Arctic and into Alaska and they dug up bodies of people who succumbed to this flu and found out what type of virus it really was, an H1N1, that circled the globe at that time. Another documentary I would recommend you to look at and watch on YouTube is The Deadliest Plague of the 20th Century, Spanish Flu of 1918 we're very much in the same boat as these folks went through right now. Not to alarm you, just to give you the idea of what these viruses represent and what type of position we are in healthcare in trying to address this situation. You look at the pictures from that era, you see the gymnasiums, the hallways of hospitals crowded with people on every bed, every cot, every space available. That is from a picture from 1918, 19 and 19 as compared to what we see today in central China. Looks very familiar, doesn't it? Back then they wore masks and they were spraying, they were spraying disinfectants to try to stop the spread of the virus in, again, 19 and 18. And we're doing the same thing today, wearing masks and spraying disinfectants. Now, this is more alarming, like in Italy, when they go down the streets and they fog the entire street and the air around it with devices such as this. That, to me, was another alarm bell. I could see using handheld sprayers and walking around and getting sidewalks and doorknobs and handrails, but when you spray the air like this with volumes of disinfectants, something is more going to be of concern to what's happening with this virus. I'm amazed what China was able to do. The, the, the industrial complex of China is breathtakingly powerful and strong. They erected over 2,500 hospital beds in 10 days, 10 days. I'm still awestruck by that. The magnitude of manpower, strength, and technology to modularly build these hospitals that rapidly was astronomically a huge feat. A functional hospital in 10 days from ground up. I compare that to any nation in the world that could try to do the same accomplishment. It would be a hard and difficult feat, even for the U.S. The Spanish flu, it was a worldwide virus and when, you, when a virus spreads through a population, we call that a blooming of the virus. It blooms through a population. It was a novel virus as well. It spread around the world three times in 18 months, beginning in 19 and 18. It went around the world in three waves. It mutated each time in 18 months when the fastest mode of transportation of the era was a steam locomotive and a steamship. Did you get that? The fastest mode of transportation was a steam locomotive and a steamship. Yet this virus circumnavigated the planet three times in less than two years. The governments of the day suppressed information. Why? They didn't want to know, let people know their population was ill, incapacitated, or suffering casualties. So all the nations of the world that were infected most of them suppressed the news media as to what was really going on because it could be jeopardizing their own home security. The one nation who didn't hide from the media what was going on was Spain because Spain was neutral in World War I. And so they had nothing to really be concerned about, nothing really to hide. So their media was more accurate to the devastation this virus was causing their population and thereby, they got the honor of being called the Spanish flu, even though it began most likely in Kansas. Governments were also worried about the economic impact. This disease, the Spanish flu, hit predominantly young adults between the ages 
of 15 to, to 35. So it was hitting healthy young adults, mostly military recruits, about two to one, men to women, and especially when they were in concentrated environments. It overwhelmed the healthcare system of the era. There wasn't enough doctors, there wasn't enough nurses, there wasn't enough hospital beds, there wasn't enough masks to go around. Sound familiar? They brought students out of medical school in their first year of training. First year medical school students took care of entire wards of hospitals by themselves. Doctors came out of retirement, nurses, technicians, lab folks, everybody who could be the walking capable person to give health care and render health care was called to the station to help. The consequence of this virus is still in question of how many casualties actually happened. There was too many people dying to even be buried appropriately to host even a funeral. They had mass graves. The funeral homes were overwhelmed. There was nothing they could do to even collect the bodies because two people were sick even to go out and help pick up the bodies. They were afraid to touch the bodies. And so they laid in the streets and the alleyways until someone finally got around to help take care of the matter. The worldwide casualties was estimated to be somewhere between anywhere around 50 million to as high as over a billion casualties of death in the world at the time. That represents at that time about 2% of the world's population by the best estimates. That's the Spanish flu. Now let's do a comparison. Spanish flu to our current epidemic. They're both, they're both novel viruses. Now why, again, is novel new viruses so alarming? The thing about the being novel is we've never had, as a species, exposure to it. So we have no, what they call, herd immunity. Herd immunity. The herd's never been exposed. So no one has a given immune potential for it yet. It's a first time exposure to our immune system to go to battle against this virus in particular. There's no at same, same situation it was in 1918 and 1919. We have no antiviral medication that's been proven to be effective. We're throwing everything we can at it. We're using the HIV medications to see if it has hope. And there's been a few cases of responding, response that patients have experienced with those type of, of uh, medications. But we have nothing in our toolbox. There's no vaccine. And there is, we'll talk more about the vaccine op op opportunity and potential, but the vaccine is, is not there. There's a worldwide involvement with both viruses, and we'll see that happen with this as well. We're trying to go into battle with it with masks, disinfectants, and quarantine areas of the world. We also have a situation, once again, where it has a potential to overwhelm our healthcare system. The R not, the R not, the R zero. This is the infectivity of a given organism, the R naught. By example, it means that the R naught for the Spanish flu was estimated to be somewhere around two. So if you took a room of 10 individuals and a person walked into the room that had the Spanish flu, that person would infect two other individuals in the room. That's an R naught of two. The R naught that just recently came out that's being talked about with our current coronavirus is 3.5 to greater than 7. 3.5 to greater than 7. A person walks in a room and there's 10 other individuals and they have the coronavirus, the COVID-19. They will infect three to seven other individuals in the room that they just, they just came into. The death rate of the Spanish flu was somewhere around 2% to perhaps 3%. This death rate now has been quoted to be at 3.4%, almost four individuals per, per se. Now, the first news came out that people present with the common cold-like features, fever, chest pain, chills, rapid heartbeat, difficulty breathing, pneumonia can be part of this issue. They thought it was spread by coughing and sneezing by droplet dispersion. So when you cough or sneeze, you spread those droplets out around you to an area of about a meter, three to, anywhere from three to five feet surrounding area. A 
Once again, looking for that R naught, the, 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 the contagious value of the virus. In this zone right here, this orange box is where they were making the early estimates of where it was falling. You see that the common flu is somewhere just around one, R naught of one. And still we have a lot of people involved in having influenza. This one was moved over to our initial R naught. They thought it was maybe as high as two and a half to three. And I just told you right now, they pushed it way up here to five or more. What's that mean? To me, it means it's probably more dispersed, not just by coughing and sneezing, that it's an airborne. It goes into the micro droplets which has a much more widespread exposure to those around the people who are infected. So here's a Lancet article just recently published saying, we should think this could look like it might be an airborne and that it might require more protection with a high grade mask, a respirator mask called an N95. So N95 masks are tight fitting, they filter your air through a through a filtering device, and they're used by healthcare providers when they're working with patients who may have this type of virus illness in play. But once again, we're a little bit short on this mask, and there's a call to have those reserved only for healthcare providers and don't have other people who are not healthcare providers hoarding them or buying them off the shelves and keeping them to herself in, in a fashion where they prevents the healthcare providers from having this protection. So droplet disbursement, again, if it's aerosolized, it can move out to as far as 30 feet around that person who's ill. Those micro droplets can spread that far around the individual. If you want to know the example of what the contagious capability of this virus is, look what happened to the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Several thousand individuals confined on this ship. It's basically a microcosm of the world at large. They were put together on that ship like we're put together on the planet. And then when they found that this virus was involving some of the members of the crew and some of the passengers, they put them into quarantine conditions, required them to stay in the room, brought their food to them, and they could go out on a deck for a few minutes, but they could not come together in any groups or populations. Even with all those quarantine efforts in place, and the, I'm sure they were disinfect, disinfecting that ship several times a day. Nearly 800 people came down with the virus. So again, it tells you how contagious it was, even with efforts to stop it on the ship. Los Alamos, the military laboratories on microbes that are used in military situations came up with the announcement that they believe this virus was, again, highly contagious. There's a reference article to that. If you read the reproduction rate, the r naught for the new coronavirus is somewhere between, they said at that time, 4.7 to 7. These numbers keep coming back again and again saying, this thing is pretty contagious. And it takes a situation like this once again to give you some reference points. You see the avian flu, you see the plague, you see Ebola, you see influenza, and then you see SARS, and you see where they land as far as their reproductive rate to a population. If you're going to control an epidemic, you must knock the R naught value down to less than one. If you're going to get control of the virus from spreading to a population, you must take the R naught down to less than one. That's what public health has to do. That's what, what healthcare has to do, to accomplish, is knock down the contagious value of this virus down to one or less. Then you have a chance of stopping it from spreading. The problem with this is this. The COVID-19, you can be contagious for 30 days before you have symptoms. They said 14 days, but we've seen cases now that's pushed it to 30 days. So when you're watching them wand individuals with a temperature check device through airports, you could still be walking around with the virus and be contagious to other individuals around you and not have a temperature. 
That's why I said that's a good thing they're doing that because other SARS viruses manifest rapidly with fever, and that was a way to pick up a SARS-like virus and populations moving around. But this one is pretty quiet. It's pretty subtle, the way it moves. And then after you have this virus, which the good news is, 80% of the time, you may have the sniffles, a minor cough, a low-grade fever, and you get over it. You're fine. No problem. But you're still contagious to others. And even though you got over the cold, the minor cold of this virus, you could go on for another 30 days and spread that virus to the people around you, even though you have no symptoms and no fever. So you got on both ends of the spectrum. You got the virus, you're walking around, you're contagious with it, but you have no symptoms. And then you might come down with some minor cold, like symptoms that last a few days, a week or two. And then after you clear, you can walk around for another 30 days, asymptomatic, spreading the virus to those around you. That's a difficult situation to get your arms around. And even patients who can maybe totally asymptomatic, they didn't even remember being ill. They had a day where they felt a little tired, a little scratchy throat, and that's all they ever manifest from this virus. Otherwise, they had no sign that they were really ill to any degree. They're asymptomatic, basically, yet they had the virus and test positive. The real concern, though, is a few percent of these patients have, are what are called super spreaders. They have a gastrointestinal manifestation. They have the vomiting and diarrhea. This is alarm bells. Because remember I told you about the SARS in Saudi Arabia. A few of those cases had the gastrointestinal manifestation. One individual who had projectile vomiting and severe diarrhea infected 100 people in healthcare. Because the burden of the virus in the vomit and in the stool is so heavy and laden with virus, it spreads it in a wide, dispersed fashion. So super spreaders are a super concern. Harvard professor recently said, this, this pandemic is likely to occur and will affect 40 to 70% of the world within a year. Think about this. It went from the center part of China at the end of December, and in less than 60 days, it went from border to border across the nation of China, a huge nation of China. Every Providence reported a case. So once it lands on your continent, it's on every continent of the world right now. I lost count of how many countries have reported. I think it's in the 60 plus range now. Somebody can look on their phone and let me know for sure. Everywhere on the planet except Antarctica has reported some virus involvement. So I predict there'll be a rapid spread. It will bloom quickly. And I predict that we'll have, what, we have 11, 12 states in, in America right now report cases. And I predict that we'll probably see all 50 states report cases within the next few weeks or a few months at the most. You can go online and look at the COVID-19 global cases by John Hopkins. It's a great resource to go to daily. They show a map of the world. They give you a tally of the reported cases and the reported deaths, and they chart that out for you as an excellent resource, the most scientific, one of the most scientific resources you can go to to see where this virus is going and where it's at and currently involved. Interesting enough, though, I saw one little mistake on this map, is it don't show the center of the United States in Omaha. Well, that's where they took some of the Princess Cruise members to in Omaha, Nebraska, because that's where we have one of our best hospitals in the nation to control contagious diseases. And so they're being quarantined there and watched there and treated there. So that's another place on a map you could add. Another source is going to be the world, the world meter of the coronavirus through the, the WHO and CDC post this, this page. You can go to it daily and it keeps a very accurate count to the cases in the world and the deaths that have occurred. So if you're looking for resources on a daily basis to the count, these are the two best I can come up with. How does the virus kill? If you go to this website, it's posted daily on YouTube. The physician here, internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, critical care, reports daily what's going on with the virus how it involves the humans as we understand it, how do we best diagnose it, how do we best treat it. So another good source for you, 
basically what happens when this virus gets into someone who's susceptible to it, you end up with ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, ARDS. You're going to diagnose this virus by using a PCR test, polymerase chain reaction test, a PCR test. The problem is a limit on the kits we had available. Initially, the only organization that had the kits, the testing kits, was the CDC. So you had to go on, on the phone, call the CDC, tell them you thought you had a suspected case, plead your case that you need to have a test done, and hope they give you a kit and ship it out to you, and you make the diagnosis whether the patient's positive or negative after all that process has occurred. That's a very slow process, very cumbersome, very time-consuming, and a lot of people get exposed to someone who's ill who may have the virus and you don't know if they're positive or not. So the CDC recently then allowed the academic labs across the nation to have kits of their own and do their own testing, so the availability of the kits is expanding rapidly. And we just heard last week a plea that we could have a, we could have a million kits produced as fast as possible for doing testing. One example being Washington State. The state of Washington wanted to test 5,000 people. They only had 300 kits. So you can't make a diagnosis if you don't have the kits. What do you do? Somebody comes in, they have viral-like symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, fever, pneumonia-like presentation. They change the criteria to say you can use a CAT scan now, a CT scan of the chest, see the pulmonary infiltrates, has somewhat of a classic presentation. We'll show that here in a little bit. To give you some clue besides laboratory testing that you have a coronavirus infection occurring in the patient. What happens besides having the ARDS, which by the way is a very difficult problem to take care of. When you have ARDS, you have a long, hard road of healthcare ahead of you for that individual. The other thing that happens with the SARS virus, it gets called a, a cytokine storm. Some people's immune system overreacts to the attack. And so your own immune system comes in and goes into a rage to fight this virus, and the rage is so hot and so intense, it hurts you. It hurts the individual. And these cytokines cause, as we know in autoimmune diseases and inflammatory arthritis conditions, they overwhelm the patient. And they basically, they attack their own tissues of their body, they destroy their own lungs, their own heart, their own kidneys, and go to multi-organ system failure and succumb to the illness. This virus seems to land on the ACE2 site of cells, the ACE2 site of cells, angiotensin converting enzyme site two. Where do you have that in your body? Well, the preponderance of that is in your lungs. And so that's why this goes into the mucous membranes of your lungs. It lands in those respiratory line cells, hits the ACE2 site, starts replicating, dumps this load of RNA messenger into the cell, takes over the, the cell mechanics, and makes your body produce more viruses for the longevity of this organism to keep going into the future. Who has a lot of ACE2s? Well, men tend to have more ACE2 receptors than women. So this virus tends to hit men five to three compared to women. Smokers tend to create more ACE2 receptors in their lungs. So smokers seem to be a little bit more susceptible. We'll talk more about that in a moment. What happens when you impair this ACE2 receptor site up here, the very top of this schematic, the ACE2 receptor site right here? When you impair that, you push it over here to angiotensin 2, and the consequences of that are pressure overloads with hypertension, and the heart is impaired, made worse with di more towards diabetic tendencies and obesity issues, resulting in heart failure and collapse. So messing around with the ACE2 receptor is not good for us as a consequence. Does that make sense? There's the next image. This is what a CT scan looks like with someone who has the, the COVID-19 infection. Notice that the locations of the infiltrates are peripheral on the lung fields. You see these lobular infiltrates on the very edges of the lung fields. 
once again, that would suggest this is going to be not droplet dispersed, but aerosolized. It's reaching out and landing in the most remote parts of your lung fields and starting to set up a home there and causing infection to occur. So you start out with a low bar like pneumonia in the peripheral margins of your lung fields, and then the whole area of your lungs white out, becomes heavily burdened, wet, heavy, thick lungs, difficult to move air, respiratory distress, ARDS. Once you reach into ARDS, there's your mortalities. I gave you 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 references to ARDS outcomes and measurements. What you're, what you're looking at here is a bar graph representing the survival rate once you come down with the diagnosis of ARDS, and you look across those margins, and it ends up to be about 50-50 chance you're going to pull through once you get ARDS. And that's usually after you've been weeks, if not a month or more on a ventilator. Weeks, if not a month or more on a ventilator. With the best specialist in that field of medicine, of critical medicine, internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, cardiovascular medicine, all on board to watch after you. Every specialist in the hospital trying to help pull you through. Now, once you've had the situation where you get knocked down by a virus, you may do well. You may come through and be not such bad a shape. But 25% of the time, once you get your immune system attacked and you're a little bit under the weather, and you're fatigued, and you're exhausted, then creeps in an opportunistic infection. And so maybe the virus doesn't take you out, but then the bacteria comes in behind it, and that takes you out, the opportunistic infection, these hospitally acquired infections. So we had to be prepared not only to deal with the virus, the first phase of the attack for an individual came down with and had a serious reaction to it, we got to worry about the opportunity to infection of the bacteria afterwards. And so I gave you a reference point there, how you manage, how you observe, and how you treat opportunistic infections. That reference right there, the best up-to-date one I can provide for you. The other problem is, you come down with this virus, and you're one of those people who say, I don't like vaccinations. I think vaccinations are evil. I think they give us diseases. I think we're putting chemicals in them. I'm a no-vaccine person. The problem with it is, the people who are not vaccinated, who came down with this virus, increase their mortality by 50%. So get your flu shot, please, if you have it. And we will, in healthcare, we're most required. You can't go to work unless you had documentation you've had your flu shot. But also get your pneumococcal vaccination, because that might be the opportunistic infection that comes in behind the virus. So you haven't had a pneumovax, Think about getting one, even though you may not be qualified by your age to be a recipient. Think about it. Think about it. Strep pneumonia is a pretty tough pneumonia to survive, even if you're healthy. And that gives you the current reference for what immunizations we should all have on board as adults in America. This is probably a very, very, very important slide. You want to take a screenshot with your phone, I would recommend. This is who's going to be affected. These are the people who are at most at risk. The very bottom of the slide, the very lowest bars there show that men are five times more involved, a five to three ratio to women. Female involvement, male involvement, so we're about five to three ratio, men more likely. Those people who are more susceptible to having death occur or people who have comorbid conditions. My patient population, patients who have autoimmune diseases, patients who have immune compromised situations with their immune systems, patients receiving immune suppressing medications for their treatment are subject to be at higher risk. Patients who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease, patients who have di type two diabetes, have hypertension and obesity issues, put them more at risk to not survive this virus. This virus has moved its attack to the oldest people in the population. Look at the ratio of death in patients over the age of 80. Raises high level concerns for those members of our family that are that age group. They really have to stay away from sick people. They really need to stay out of public places. 
they need to stay in a situation where they protect themselves away from this virus until it sweeps through and it's behind us. Dropping down, you see the next group goes a high preponderance over the age of 60. The blessing of this disease is look where the children are, almost non-existent involvement. Dr. Anthony Fauci, a very, very famous, very, very good researcher and scientist. He made his fame on the AIDS epidemic and HIV infection. He still works at the CDC as a leader, he's a spokesperson, you see him on television, frequently giving updates, giving reports to Congress. Truly a remarkable man, a hero. He comes up and says here a few days ago, back, well, it's back in February 3rd, this is a statement. Dr. Anthony Fauci says 25% individuals who come down with the coronavirus end up being seriously ill. Other people exposed, around 80%, like I said, are fine. A minor cold-like symptom. They go on their way, get over it in a few days, and they go, it's all good. But 25% of the people who get this virus get really super sick, require hospitalization, and require all likely intensive care. That's when I started getting more alarmed. That's when, get ready, it's going to be a rough ride for us in healthcare. Now, here's what the world's doing right now. I made this kind of a teeter totter like picture. The teeter totter being, on one side, an uncontrolled pandemic, epidemic gone to a pandemic. And they argued for a long time about whether it's going to be an epidemic or a pandemic, and that's semantic in a, in a fashion. And then at the same time, what's this going to have an impact on the economy? Because this began in China. And China is the engine of the world, the industrial engine of the world. They are by far and away the major manufacturer of, of, the, of the planet. The disease becomes, in that part of the world, it knocks down our industrial engine. It lock, knocks down a lot of things. And so, Besides worrying about this disease spreading, you've got to worry about its impact on the economy, on the industrial process of the world to take care of itself. And then you've got to put that on the shoulders of the global health care system. They are going to carry the burden of these sick people, balanced on the, the epidemic spreading versus the impact to people going, being able to go to work and do a normal day's job and have access and resources to take care of themselves in the process. And the governments are all trying to balance these three things in the circle. Do you keep people confined for months and months and months? And how are they going to get pay? How are they going to be able to afford to pay their bills if they're not going to work or they're quarantined? How are you going to go to school and get educated if you can't go to classes? How are you going to turn factories on and make things in factories if you're quarantined? Everything comes to a, a standstill until you've got to say, we've got to get out and run the risk of getting infected, but we have to, somebody has got to go, got to, got to, go, got to work, and turn the lights on, get the water flowing, fix things that are broken, right? So you have to balance that between exposure to the need of moving the economy ahead. And then if you let it go, if you go cavalier with it, and let everybody go out and mingle around each other, and come, come to congregation events, and you get a bunch of people sick, then you put all that burden back on health care. And now your hospital's filled up to the brim with sick people rushing to the emergency room, rushing to go, to, to go find a hospital bed and find someone to come take care of them. In some part, you have to watch what they're doing and not listen to what they're saying on television. All right? At some point, you have to Watch what they're doing and not listen to what they're saying to get the reality of the situation. Right now, 760 million people in China are being quarantined. That's double the size of the U.S. population is in quarantine in China. Imagine that impact. They're keeping this disease under control with draconian military-enforced quarantine situation. And the Chinese people are doing a wonderful job of trying to stop the spread of this disease. But it's the most strictest quarantine environment that we would probably not tolerate. 
they are used to, to listening to their government. They are used to following the rules. They are used to having the military over, take charge of their, their lives. Not so, I don't think, in the nation of America. I don't think we would succumb to that type of quarantine environment. I think we would, we would probably rebel. We would try to get around it. We would try to sneak around it. We would try to crawl around and get past barriers and still get out and mingle together. We're a little bit wild over here compared to those folks. Again, greater than 80% of the Chinese industrial system has been shut down. Their factories, 80% of them are shut down, inactive, no one's going to work. Look what's happening across the world. They're canceling major meetings and events and conferences around the world. I'm worried about if Japan is going to be able to host the Olympics now. And there's questions now if they can really pull it off in the, this summer and have the Summer Olympics with this, with this epidemic in place in their country. Look what's happening when militaries are taking over food supplies and medical supplies in countries. And they take charge of that and take it out of the hands of the, of the individual private consumers and private industry. Watch for the closures, closures of schools and colleges and universities in, in major countries like Japan, like China, like Italy, and like parts of Washington State. Watch what's happening when they alter and close down and cancel entertainment and sports events. And then be cautious of what this impact is on the material supply chain and disruption. Now your response to this could be several things. Most of it is, again, cavalier. Don't worry about it. Denial. It's a good place to be. It's a comfortable place to be. Because no one wants to go to bed thinking about these things or wake up in the morning and be the first thought in your mind. You want to just go about your life and be happy and don't worry. And that's fine. That's that we should stay in that part for as long as we can. The next part is you, you become so overwhelmed, but you become catatonic. You, you just stop. You just freeze. You don't act. You don't remove. You just stand still. You get in a fetal position and hide. That's not a response either. It's going to gain you anything. And so you, you balance between being in a state of denial and to the state of being catatonic. And you want to be in a state of activity. Do what you can do. Do what you can do for yourself to stay healthy and help those around you. That's where you want to be. Keep in an upright mode. Keep in a healthy mode. Eat well. Sleep well. Take care of each other well. So you can stand on your feet and keep helping the one beside you to your right and left and to the front and behind you. That's where we want to be. I get upset when I see the government's work under a PC type of modality, the politi politically correct words to say. Or I call, also call it panic control. Don't get the people panicked. Well, you're right. Panic is a bad place to be. We don't want to be rushing around, fighting each other, grabbing things, and worried about the world around us. But we do want to function with proper public health policies in place. And that's going to be, again, good hand washing. Modifications of lifestyle that we'll talk about here in more detail. Quarantining people who are ill and recognizing they're ill as soon as possible and getting them away from other folks. I get worried when I hear big organizations say, we got this under control. Mm. Do we? The battle's just begun. It's a little bit early to announce that we've won victory on this thing and say we have it under control. So the word is, they've been trying to avoid is using the word pandemic because I think the new word I'm going to call it is called panic-demic. They're trying to avoid the sense of panic. They don't want, don't want people rushing stores and buying all the items off the shelf and going into short supply and hoarding and doing all the crazy things that happens in the state of panic. I'm not agree to that. And then using body temperature screening to control the disease spread, I told you right now, that's not going to work with this virus. You walk around for weeks before and weeks after asymptomatic with no fever, spreading the germs. So using temperature control is one device to help detect people who possibly have the illness, but it's not going to be bulletproof to stopping the disease. The other thing we wake up in the morning, hear the news. We have the hope of a miracle vaccine that's going to happen here, and it's going to stop this virus, and it's going to save lives. Well, Dr. Anthony Fauci informed the president even with the scientists working at breakneck, breakneck speed, 24, 365, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it will take them a year and a half to find an effective vaccine, most likely. By that time, I told you this virus is going to sweep the world 
at least once and maybe more times before a vaccine's available. And then once the vaccine's available, who's gonna get it first? John Q. Citizen? No. The government and the military will get it first to keep themselves in place, and we'll have to wait in line. Wear face masks, eye protection, good hand washing is all you can do. We were assured on TV, ABC, all the channels, CBS, NBC, name a, name a channel. They say the, the best doctors come under and say the best thing you do is good hand washing technique, stop handshaking, stop kissing, cough into your elbows, sneeze into your elbow. We'll talk about that in a second, a little bit more detail. It's no worse than the common flu. That's not accurate. It's far worse than a common flu. So yeah, we do have people who succumb to the influenza every year, and we have significant casualties, but the casualty rate for that average is somewhere way less than 1% of the population that gets ill. The problem has been that even though we had the, P, the PCR test, it's inaccurate to maybe as high as 30% of the time it gives a false negative reading on the PCR. And then we don't have enough available tests, I told you all ago. We don't have enough test, test kits to, to go around. So if you don't test, there's no cases identified, right? That's why the numbers might be falsely low if you're not testing, because you're not looking for it. That's one state of denial to be in. And as I told you before, you had to get authorization from the CDC originally to get even a test kit available. You had to get on the phone and argue with somebody at headquarters. You think you have a sick patient, I need a kit, I need a kit now. And you may have to wait days or longer before someone will let you test the person you think has a disease. We in America claim to have the best healthcare system in the world, but we also have our limitations, people. We may be the best, most scientific, the most efficient, the most progressive healthcare system in the world, but we've lost a half a million hospital beds in America since 1975. We're down to just shy of a million hospital beds in America serving a population of over 300 million. Okay, so we let our beds go into attrition and we close down hospitals and we close down beds and we don't have the staffing to expand that very easily. Do you realize we have less than 100,000 ICU beds in America? Less than 100,000 ICU beds in America. So I told you this disease, 25% of people get seriously ICU sick those beds right now are occupied at a high level of about 65% of those beds are already occupied today with people who are sick on average. So the expansion bandwidth of our ICU capacity is limited. And guess what? If they do have ARDS and have to go on a ventilator, we have somewhere shy of 70,000 ventilators in America to work with. We've got limitations. And I'm not sure how fast we expand the number of beds we have. We can't, I don't think we can build 2,000 beds in 10 days. Maybe China can teach us how to do that. There he is. There's one report. You can look these stats up and Google it and confirm what I told you. One stat there is showing we have, what, 94,000 plus ICU beds active right now in America. Now, the CDC says to us with wisdom saying, and who says, avoid touching your face. Avoid touching your face. Do you know how many times you, on average, as a human being, touch your face in a given day? One, three times an hour to as high as 23 times an hour. So it can go from a few hundred times a day to over, well over 3,000 times a day you're touching your, your face, your head, with your hands. So it's kind of a hard habit to break, you know? Keep your hands to yourself, keep your hands out of your face, it's a, it's a challenge. You gotta think about it. I think the most important thing of a, a traditional, just a surgical mask is not so it protects you from spreading the disease or from getting the disease, it keeps your hands out of your face. It's the most important thing the mask is about. Avoid handshakes, avoid knuckle punches, avoid high fives, avoid hugs and kisses. So how do you greet each other now? Well, do the elbow bump, really? Where did I just sneeze? Where did I just cough? And then I'm going to bump you with it. Right? I don't buy that one. 
Wash your hands for at least 20 seconds or sing happy birthday to yourself twice while you're washing your hands. Physically, mechanically, soap and water, wash your hands. Wash your hands. And wash your hands. Every time before you touch a patient, wash your hands in front of them. Do it like a ritual. Do it methodically. Do it habitually. Do it so they can be reassured you're coming to them with clean hands. Wash your hands, and then probably afterwards, glove your hands. Not to protect you from them, but protect them from you, which you might be carrying. Avoid touching public surfaces. You know, I remember what, even years ago, I've always been somewhat, obviously, a germaphobe. And I watch the kids go through the stores and run their hands up and down the handrails and grab every item around them and touch every surface they're around. I go, stop touching everything around you. Put your hands away. Put it with dust up. Don't, don't grab it. Go up the stairs, but don't hold on to the handrails. Those places are difficult to control and ch difficult to change. I, this is WebMD. I looked it up just the other day. Here are 15 germy things in your life. 15 germy things in your life. Your cell phone, your remote controls, your keyboards, your dish sponge at your sink in the kitchen, your toothbrush holders, your break rooms at work, your pets' toys, your money is dirty. Did you know that? Money is dirty, really super dirty. I mean, see what China did to their currency? They confiscated it to get out of circulation to stop the spread of the disease. Your coffee cups that you don't wash so well. Your laundry rooms. Your purses, ladies, is kind of a thing you should watch out for. ATMs, kitchen towels, towels of any nature. Soap dispensers, shopping carts. Areas with high, high germ exposure. I'm gonna to add to that list my 10, I had the, the Jackson Plus 10. Your stethoscopes, doctors. You never wash them down, you never wipe them off. You're taking that scope and you're going from patient to patient to patient to patient to patient with it. And you didn't clean it once. In fact, all your exam instruments, your hammers, your otoscopes, your thermoscopes, you're not wiping them off. You're not sterilizing them. You're not cleaning them. What do you think that is? It's called a fomite. A fomite. It's a germ-carrying object. And you should not be spreading that object between the patients and between individuals you're caring for. You need to take time and cleanse your clinical and hospital environment that you're working with. The most important person in this hospital team is gonna be the housekeeper. We'll save more lives than the doctors and nurses will if they're doing their job properly. Give them your utmost thanks and appreciation for their job. Neckties, yeah, it looks good to have tie, but do you ever wash your tie? You ever sanitize your tie? That tie where you lean over a patient that swings across the bed in the environment, and then you put the same tie on and you just spilt food on it at lunch. <laughs> you wipe it off, go on your way. Get rid of the ties now, if you wear them. Your laboratory coats. I see the students walk in. They're not white coats, they're kind of gray <laughs> with a ring around the collar. Wash your coats all the time, change them out. Don't tuck them outside of the hospital. Put them in a bleach it's, you know, wash with, with hot water. Clean your lab coats. If you're gonna wear one, clean them and change them frequently and have several dozen of them. Another dirty part of the environment in the hospital is the privacy curtains. Those drapes between the beds that people grab and pull across and try to give you a little bit of privacy. Who washes those and how often are they washed? It's one of the dirtiest items in the hospital. Don't grab that curtain. Don't touch that curtain. If you can, tear them off the wall and throw them in the and get them out of there. They're, t they're terrible. The carpets and cloth items, the cloth seats. How do you sterilize a cloth seat? How do you sterilize the carpet? Hospitals should be hard floors, not carpeted floors. I know it's nice not to hear the noise in the hallway. It's a quieter, more peaceful environment but you can't sterilize carpet very, very easily. Waiting rooms and reading material, get those magazines out of there now, burn them. They're the filthiest things in, in that waiting room is, is, a, is a community shared magazine or the, even anywhere else where you have a, a magazine to pick up, get rid of them. 
the, 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 the pens where you check in at the desk, you sign your name in, and they hand you a pen that's had been handed to 100 people before you. I'm not trying to get you paranoid. I'm trying to get you the reality of what's happening. The touch screens where you have to sign your name when you get your credit card and check yourself in. They're hardly ever wiped down. All indoor handles. And the worst thing in the, in the restrooms is not use the blow dryers. People, what happens when you put your hands down inside that blow dryer? Where's the air blowing up into? Your face. Use paper towels. Hopefully, it's got a motion detector. You can grab them without touching anything. And then as you leave, you can open a door with a paper towel so you're not touching the handles as you go in and out of the facilities. Where are our drugs made? China RX, April 2018. This book says, hey, people, we're in trouble. We're offshoring all our production of medications to China. We've got a one source for the majority of our medications, and that was being China. So if China stops making medicine, what's going to happen to our medicine? We have a few months on the shelf stock supply available. Now over there where I got circled, it says that 97% of our antibiotics are made in China. 80% down here of our essential medication ingredients are made in China. So when China gets sick, we all get sick. Right? So once again, the Council on Foreign Relations said the U.S. is way too dependent on the pharmaceutical products from China. It represents a, a, a national security threat to the United States. That happened, that was announced just last fall before the infection was even announced. So if China starts, stops production, we run short on everything for cancer, heart disease, epilepsy, you name it, we are going to run short on medication. So when you can, and when it's permissible, and when patients have the ability to get 90-day supply, please write a script for 90 days. Don't limit them, especially if it's a life-requiring medication for that individual. Give them a little extra stock, a little extra security. Well, now that I got us all on the edge of our seats, I hope, we realize that when, as Hamlet said in Act 4, Scene 3, but a, but a terminal disease requires extreme treatment or nothing at all. And I've taken you really, really down low to a low point of worry, maybe, and concern. And, and you know, knowledge is power, and knowledge is an opportunity to respond in an effective scientific way, an ethical way, moralistic way. So I, I, don't, I don't feel anything bad I've done. I've got everything I've put up there has been justified by science and by very, very important people around the, around the world. Now I'm going to give you some hope. I'll give you some hope now that there's there is chances that we can pull through and give you the good news with a glimmer of hope as we go to the second half. And I will also give you time to ask your questions because you will inform me a lot by what's happening in your world, in your communities, and the parts that you will go back to and serve after you leave this location. And we'll help each other find solutions. We talked about the vaccine. Traditional vaccines are down in this corner where it's circled here. We're using a attenuated live virus or you're taking biased particles and you're making a vaccine out of it. That's a traditional way of making a vaccine since the beginning of the vaccination process. The new methodology is up here at the top is where you actually take the RNA molecule of the virus and you're using that to promote an immune response with the vaccine. So an RNA-based vaccine is what they're going for. And Dr. Anthony Fouch said, we're doing that as fast as we can. We think it's effective. We think it's, it's going to be a very a way of stopping this virus from spreading, and we're going, all of our focus is going to get an RNA-based vaccination to come out as fast as possible. But even with the best of efforts, pushing it through the system, pushing it through the, putting it into the field in phase, phase one, two, and three trials to the utilization will take us probably 18 months. I'm not sure that's fast enough to get ahead of the tsunami that's coming on us, okay? That's all I'm saying. So uh, the vaccine will be there, but we're going to have to wait a little while. I already mentioned about touching your face and changing the way you do your life. And you know, L Lloyd came up with a mask on. I think it was upside down and inside out. But the main thing, the main reason we have it there is to keep reminding you, it does keep the droplets from dispersing as much. It doesn't keep the 
the aerosolized molecules from coming in from the sides of your mask unless it's tight fitting around your face. And by the way, they're telling us to get rid of our beards so those masks will fit tighter and not have a gap in space around it. And if you're obviously sick and, you're, and you do have this virus and you're coughing into your environment, the mask will kind of keep you from spreading into droplets around your immediate proximity. But mom was right. Stop picking your nose. Stop putting your hands and your fingers in your mouth. Keep your hands to yourself more and more all the time. And I don't say don't do the elbow bump. I'm saying just do this. Just cross your arms or put items in your hand so people won't be tempted to reach out and try to grab your hand, you know, and, and approach your ear that way with courtesy and, and grace. And we'll go on to what we should do for our own pantries. And this is regardless of this virus. This is if you have hurricanes and where the parts of the world where you live. This is what happens if you have tornadoes come through your communities. The, if you have a nat national disaster or local disaster, these are the things you want to have in your pantry. 25 items that everyone should have in case of a short-lived emergency. So there's your answer. I, I said 25, I think it says 37 items that you should have in your pantry. Just Google that up and you'll find those items in detail. What happened back in the great influenza of 19 and 18 and 19 and 19, that some of the best results that came out of that were from the doctors who had the laying on of hands. And this article talks about the great flu pandemic and that the outcomes of those patients who were seeing osteopaths and chiropractors had better survival rates than those who were going to traditional medicine because they we're doing manual technique of rib raising, lymphatic pump, relaxing the diaphragms on people who were struggling to breathe. And so that manual treatment, the laying on of hands, had better outcomes than those who did not receive that treatment. By the way, in 1918, they didn't have a ventilator, mechanical device. You just had to breathe on your own. If you didn't breathe on your own, you were done. And so the laying on of hands, the rib raising, Diaphragm treatments, lymphatic pump, was helping those congested people breathe and survive at a better rate than those who were not receiving that therapy. Does that make sense? Hope you can appreciate that we had an impact then, and we have a likely impact now. If you've not listened to this TED Talk, I implore you as a physician to go and Google this Abraham Valgrises a Doctor's Touch TED video. Please. What I just tell you is going to go with this disease. We're going to stop touching each other. We're going to avoid each other. We're going to put our hands out and back away. What do humans need? We need touch. We thrive with touch. If you take a baby and you don't touch a baby, the baby will die without touch. You must put your hands on to heal. Do not run away from this virus. You can't run away from it, so don't even worry about running away from it. Don't be cavalier, but don't run from this virus. It's going to come to you whether you want it or not. So, so give the loving touch back. Don't be scared to touch your patients. Okay? We do have hope. A year ago, a year ago, a company approached me from out of Overland Park, Kansas. The company's name was Danolite. They told me they had a disinfectant that could be beneficial for organic farming for both plants as well as animals. I said, really? Why are you asking me? I said, we hear you like to deal with germs and deal with superbugs and you had to fight these moles and candida things going through hospitals. So maybe you can tell us about our product. I said, that it would be effective in the food market and safe. I said, what do you have? Well, we have this product it's called hypochlorous, hypochlorous acid. Well, that doesn't sound so good, acid, hypochlorous acid. I said, is it like bleach? No. You know, what is it? What do you have? Is it like alcohol? 70% alcohol or stronger? No. 
it's a compound, hypochlorous acid, is what your body produces. It's what your cells produce to fight off viruses, bacteria, and fungus. We produce hypochlorous acid to fight off the germ world. It's our natural defense system. It basically has two very rare ingredients, water and salt. It kills off 100% of the fungus, the bacteria, and the environment within three minutes of exposure to it. It purifies water. You can spray it in your face, your eyes, your throat, your mouth. You can drink it. You can put it on your food. You can spray it on your pets and your babies. It's that benign. With nearly zero odor. And how many people do you know that are allergic to water and salt? It's hypoallergenic. It doesn't destroy any material it touches. I said, I'm interested. I don't want this just for food products or the agribusiness of farm animals and creatures. I want it in my hospitals and clinics now to clean, to clean my IV infusion rooms, to clean the chairs and the environment. How do, you, how do you, you rub it on a rag and wipe down things manually? No. What do you do? We use an electrostatic sprayer. We, uh, we take that partic particle of this misty of water we make a positive charge on it, and we spray the environment with a sprayer. Because it's positive charge, it goes in every nook and cranny from ceiling to floor, on every surface, whether it be cloth, metal, plastic, wood. It goes in every spot around you and every crook and cranny of that keyboard you can think of. They took a, a UV dye and put it into this device sprayer, sprayed a 12 by 24 hospital room in less than 20 seconds, or less than 30 seconds at least. And then we turned off the lights, put on the black light, and the stuff was everywhere in the room to be seen. It was on the crutches, the wheelchairs, on the underside of the mattress and bed springs. It was everywhere, everywhere. And it was killing everything in that room that you even that you even didn't wipe down. So you could go through them this size here and spray it down, just misting randomly around you, and walk around here in less than a few minutes and, and totally neutralize the microbial environment around you without you having stinging, burning eyes, smelling an odor that you didn't, was unpleasant. It was unphenomenally believable. Made here in the Midwest of America. It goes by several different names. It's called Agrolite in the agribusiness. It's called Danolite, more in the utility of, of offices and clinics. They have one called Nix, Nixol from Nixon, Missouri, which is the same product. They have a generator that used to be as big as the screens on both sides of me here. In the last three years, they engineered the, 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 the generator of this chemical down to the size of a big to uh, toaster oven. And they could generate literally gallons and gallons and gallons of this hypochlorous acid at a concentration of 500 parts per million all day long, day and night. And it only takes a small fraction of that that you dilute 10 to 1 and then use it, and again, an electrostatic sprayer, and you can cleanse and purge your environment in a short period of time. I do not own any stock in the company. I'm not a paid spokesperson. They only came to me as a medical advisor and asked me some questions. And I go, wow, isn't it neat that Mother Nature, Mother Earth, with its most two abundant ingredients, water and salt, has given us a first line of defense? And we can do this to ourselves and take, take care of our clinics, take care of our hospitals, take care of our homes. When I first showed this to the people working with me, I said, what do you think of this product? They go like, well, I want this in my house. And that was my aha moment. I mean, it's like everybody's going to want this in their environment, constantly available. But when I come back from the clinic, I'll stop at the door, and I'll take off my contaminated clothes and put them in a pile and bag them up 
and I'll spray myself down before I go back and expose my, my, my family, my friends, the other people around me. And I won't smell like anything. I'll, sm I'll smell natural. It's amazing. So we have a hope. There's a, there's a very effective, and there's lots of disinfectants. I just say this one really caught my eye. And the way it disperses in a way and covers all this complicated, convoluted material and cloth and stuff around us was what I said we have to have. Do you know what the average turnaround time for an airplane when they clean it is what, less than 30 minutes? The average turnaround time for a hospital room when they change patients is less than 30 minutes clean time. So again, those housekeepers have got their work cut out to get in there and clean those rooms and disinfect them in a matter of minutes between patients. That's a tough job. And to get every nook and cranny with a cloth and a hand -witten, you know, wipe situation is tough. But now those curtains we talked about can be sanitized. And the cloth chairs and the books you want to keep out there in a room for kids to look at. You can spray this mister, and now you've killed them and sanitized them between between patients or between in, in, at the beginning and the end of the day, all day long. You could put this on your mask. You could, you could basically spray your mask down and use that as a barrier to, as you're breathing in and out. You could carry a small amount in your pocket that's legal by the airplane standards. And if you touch something and you want to clean your hands real quick and you have problems with the other things, topical gel is causing you some topical irritation, this won't cause a topical irritation. Does that make sense? We'll talk more about it when you have time for questions about it. We have to go back to ancient history. What did the ancient people do? What did people do before we had antibiotics? You go back into the beginning of recorded history. They knew that certain parts of our environment are antimicrobial. One thing being silver. The ancients knew that silver containers would keep and preserve food from, from getting bacteria and fungus breakdown. That sterilizes water. Silver sterilizes water. The military, the, the guys who were put in confinement camps during World War II, they threw silver coins into their water supply to sterilize their water they were getting in the prison camps. Throwing the coin into the wishing well wasn't to wish for a good wish. It was to sterilize the well water. It wasn't wishing for good things to happen. It was to sterilize the water. We've known this, again, for centuries. And this article here, you can go to BBC, has a series of, of broadcasts called The Elements. And it takes every element on the periodic chart, and it talks about how that element was discovered, how it's utilized by industry, and how it's used by mankind in general. And this one talks about the benefits, the antimicrobial benefits of silver. Again, we knew this already. They put silver into cloth, into clothes, so hunters can go out and hunt in the woods and the deer can't smell them. It's an odor defense system. The military uses it for the clothes that the, the combats use because they may have to go into battle and not have a shower for days and, or a bath for days, so it keeps their body under a more homeostatic status there with having silver lined clothes and socks and apparel. We put silver lined catheters in people who have long term indwelling bladder catheters so it cuts down on their secondary infections. We put silver nitrate in babies' eyes at birth so they won't get gonorrhea conjunctivitis at the time of their birth. We've known this for a while. We have silver amalgam dental implants for cavities because the silver amalgam helps keep you get a bacterial infection around your, around your filling. We've known this for a long time. So there's a part here, we're talking about using nanotechnology, using nanomolecules of silver to be antimicrobial in its impact, and it will virtually take out every microbe in the environment, every fungus, every bacteria, every virus, including coronavirus. It even kills off C. diff, which is the same as true for the hypochlorous acid, C. diff is a spore molecule, you know, microbe. It's difficult to kill, and it will take it out. Both of these will take it out. So there's hope here with the metal of silver. Articles that support that are followed up here. The silver nanoparticles for potential antiviral agents. There's an article reference right there. You can take a snapshot. You can pick it up later. 
And these, were, these articles were written back a, a decade ago. Ions are the particles are what make the silver lethal, lethal to microbes. It's the ion effect of, the, of these metals. These are not toxic metals per se. They're not the heavy metals that we have to run away from, like mercury and arsenic and what have you. These are more biologically compatible to the human being to have silver as part of our intake of our environment. We used to get quite a bit of silver out of our food sources, but we've depleted our soil of silver, and our plant source of silver coming to us naturally has been reduced over the, over the years. So we don't get as much natural silver in our diet as we once did in the past. Again, looking, scientists looking into the way that silver might help us kill off the superbugs. The other, the other metal that has importance here is copper. Another BBC article on the elements under, car, under copper. If you go to this one in particular, listen to it. Listen to the, go through and listen. At, start at the beginning of 37 minutes into the tape recording and listen to that beyond that point. It talks about the antimicrobial impact of, of copper. Copper, once again, it destroys every fungus, every bacteria, every virus it comes in contact with. It basically blows up the cell walls of those microbes. So there's no resistance that ever develops with it. This is why we had copper pipes in our water systems, because it, st it sterilizes the water beyond what happens at the water plant, okay? That's why we had copper containers that we hold our, our, our distilleries and things in, because it has that antimicrobial impact. That's why we have copper socks to kill your foot odor, and copper-lined clothing. It's so much of a positive impact, get this. They put copper cladding into the ICUs of hospitals, so every surface, of the ICU that was appropriate to have copper on it. The, the, guard, the handrails on the beds, the tops of the counters and tables had copper added to the environment. It knocked down the nosocomial infection rate in the ICUs by at least 50% to higher. So copper on the surfaces of these things had a positive impact. Let me jump back to silver and say this about silver. Remember we had silverware, when actual silverware was silverware? Utensils, you know why? Not because it was at any value, other than the fact that we didn't have very clean water to wash off our, our eating utensils, and the silver spoons, and the silver forks and knives would kill the bacteria, with, even though it wasn't wiped down so well by the ancient folks. Does that make sense? So copper cladding, again, study proves that copper reduces nosocomial infections in the hospital by a, a, above 50% rate or higher. Another hope is our, our hemp growth in America using CBD. There's some research that shows that we are growing our own marijuana and making medical products out of that might lead to some antimicrobial and antibacterial products down the road. And there's several research articles looking into the antibacterial capabilities of CBD, cannabidiol. So we can get back into the pharmacy business again with our own plants that we grow locally and we produce in factories in this country. A TED Talk again talks about how we can use the, f the fungus in our diet, the mushrooms, six ways that mushrooms can save the world. Another TED cast that you should listen to. Part of it talks about that, that, that mushrooms are antibacterial and they're antiviral. So there's hope. There's actually quite a bit of hope. My predictions for how the winds of change will, will come over us, how, this, how is this world gonna change? There'll be far less socialization, far less physical intimacy. So fight against that. Give the healing touch back to your patients. Fight against the, the desire to stay hidden away and isolated and quarantined to some degree. You'll see more shortages uh, and panic buying and people hoarding, okay? It's already happening. And Andrea, my partner, went down to the local department stores and the shelves were already pretty much bare of sanitizing hand wipes and sanitizing lotions to use. So there's already a rush 
in the, in the middle of nowhere America. And there's not a single case of coronavirus in our state of Missouri. In the future, there'll be less formal funerals will stop. Because funerals are where people come together and hug and get close, and that could spread the disease. And plus, that body there in front of you that passed away from perhaps a corona illness is still harboring virus and spreading it. And so the best way to deal with it, unfortunately, is going to be cremation. So cremations will go up, especially if we're overwhelmed with, with casualties and deaths. We'll have to look at emergency expansion of clinics and wards and hospitals where you can take and house people. Because not everybody's going to be you know, seriously sick. They'll be sick enough that they're scared. They'll be sick enough they're going to come to your urgent care and emergency rooms and, and overwhelm you to a bit because they want to be tested to see if they had the virus or not. So you have to triage and use your resources wisely. And basically, if you think you're coming down with a cold and kind of ill, in the future, if it's, if it's an epidemic locally, the worst place to go is to a hospital because here you're definitely going to get exposed if you didn't have it to begin with. So don't overwhelm those, those sources. Try to take care of yourself and do some home remedies. Keep some NSAIDs, anti-inflammatories, anti-fever medication around. Take care of it that way. It's going to be an urgent call for all hands on deck. So if you think about retiring, wait for a while. We, we may need you. If you're going to healthcare, get a fast track and get in healthcare as fast as you can. We're to be more telemedicine. And guess what? The best news for me is, with this virus comes to full impact, you can kiss the computer goodbye. EHRs are going to be history. You won't have time to get out and chart. You'll be busy taking care of people. In Wuhan, the doctors came on their shifts, and the nurses, and the health center staff, they came in, they put on their biohazard suits, they worked six hour shifts with no food, no water, no bathroom breaks for six hours. They came out of their suits, they decontaminated their bodies with harsh chemicals, and they went into quarantine and they laid in, they lived in quarantine dorms for weeks to months on end. They couldn't go back to their own families. It's a tough chore when it gets that serious. But guess what? They didn't spend hours with their bio suits on trying to type on a keyboard into the medical record. Didn't have time. You'll see cash disappear because money is a fomite spreading germs. So the cash environment will probably rapidly just go to a cashless society and cashless commerce. Again, it's kind of hard to work on computers when you're wearing those kind of suits and spraying down the environment. You're going to be taking care of people. We get back to taking care of people. That's going to be fun, actually. China banned formal funerals. They enforced cremations. They grabbed the bodies, took them out of the, took them out of the environment, put them away, and disposed of them. That's the heat source coming out of Wuhan, China, because even though all the industry was shut down, the factories were not producing anything, there's no smokestacks in the air, that was the, that was the carbon dioxide image over that part of the world, which means their, their crematories were on full, full activity. They stopped, their they stopped moving cash around. They confiscated their cash. The banks wrapped it all up, sterilized it, put it in vaults, and hid it away, took it out of circulation. The hope, I told you, there's some hope in the things I just listed there that we could use as antimicrobials we never thought of. We knew about it, but we never applied it to any effectiveness. We hope that the spring and the summer warm weather will slow down the spread of the virus. So as we go into the warmer days of spring and summer, there's a hope that the coronavirus, like other coronaviruses, will slow down its impact as far as spreading around. The southern hemisphere will have to worry a little bit, like Argentina reported its first case, so they may be in trouble because they're going into their winter. The great news is the children, the babies, the pregnant mothers are somewhat spared. Only a small fraction of the young people are going to be impacted, so our kids are going to be fine. That's wonderful. Our pets and livestock will be spared, so our food sources and our animals that give us love and pleasure will be around. There's hope in this novel RNA vaccine coming out in a rapid fashion to be very effective for us. And there's a chance this virus could mutate and become more benign. And it burn itself out, mutates to being more benign with less illness, less casualties, less death, and nature itself will let us go into a, a, a place of happiness. This is the wallpaper in my hotel room. This, this thing is chasing me around the planet. 
Thank you, people.